be me, Paladin, be not me, be Peregrine the Halfling, Casdor the Dwarven Born, Julian the Asima, Senkit the Tifling, and Andres the Elf, also, be Yord the Hobgoblin Prisoner slash Recruit slash Conscript, party has set out into the Summer Lands, traveling down the river seeking Bloodystone Abbey, seat of power for the local Hobgoblin Warlord, party begins cleaning up their last fight, taking a small bridge, committing the bodies to the water. Peregrine goes to say his usual prayer for the dead, but Eort raises a hand to stop him. They're soldiers of a war host, Magulai Bet has them already. They don't need your prayers, the halfling nods and moves on. After about an hour of travel, he strikes up conversation with Eort. So, when did you come to the Summerlands? Born here, back about a year after my father's legion took San Jonas. I've lived my whole life in these woods. What was San Jonas like? A ruin, mostly. It was probably the largest city in the area once upon a time, centrally located with the old Dwarven road running through it from north to south and the river running through it from the Great Lake in the east to the sea, probably human built, but it had inhabitants from all over. Elves once, but your friend with the bow is the last living elf we've seen in these lands for decades, bar the occasional drow raid. Andres raises an eyebrow at the mention of her dark kin, but keeps her peace. Sounds like quite the place. What ruined it though? Never really figured it out. Years of fighting between war hosts, orc hordes, and worst of all the gnolls hasn't helped, but I get the feeling that place died before any northerner started fighting over it. What makes you think that? Well there's the copious amounts of undead that we can't seem to get rid of for one thing. Place is cursed, but it's too important to not try to hold on to. Even when we had control nobody slept in the elven quarter. Too many angry dead and whalers. Whalers? Never seen one, think they might have been a myth, a boogie man of sorts. Supposed to look like an elven woman in a bridal dress, beautiful until you get close, then all her skin falls off and she screams so loud your soul shatters like a window when a brick hits it. Sounds like a banshee to me. Senkit mutters as she marches on. Say Hob, you ever seen anything unusual at night here? Something just where your vision cuts off? The Hobgoblin fidgets nervously. Never seen anything per se, but you always feel like there's something out there that you can't see, but don't wanna see neither. He by Giebis you know. Andres and Senkit glance at one another knowingly. The party moves on until dark falls and sets up camp. Eort proves himself to be a useful and diligent worker, assisting in gathering firewood and constructing basic defenses. Kazdor remains intensely suspicious and sets out his bedroll opposite him. In the night. The party is awoken by a new sound, like howls but certainly not made by any wolf, somewhere between the mocking of a jester and the snarling of a beast in the distance. For those that can see them, the vines seem fewer in number, but thicker, and they visibly pulse with dark life. Things move out there in the dark, not drawing near, but the presence of some things is clear, even to Julian. Despite the potential risks of being spotted, the fire stays bright through the whole of the night. In the morning, the party wakes to see smoke rising in the west. After some debate, they decide to investigate. After two hours march, the wind shifts and blows from the west. It is a fell and sickly wind, fetid with the stench of ash and death. They redouble their pace. Within another hour, they crest a hill and look down upon a small sheltered valley carved by the river flowing out to the sea. There was a village here, once. Now. Only a charnel pile remains. The mocking laughter of hyenas and gnolls taints the verdant morn as the sons of butchery delight in their wicked feast. The remnants of docks, houses too small for men, and the scattered remains of a feasting green, now crimson cast, show that the small bones lying scattered and naught as the gluttonous mob blazes about gorging itself once belonged to halflings. Peregrine's face is unreadable, as he begins to mutter prayers in his own tongue. His hands ball into fists clenching so tightly that his palms bleed. He does not weep. Not yet. Kazdor lays a hand on his small friend's shoulder. No words are spoken, but an unspeakable understanding passes between the two men. At last, Peregrine speaks. Andres, where is their leader? He demands, his voice a monotone, like the beach as the water rolls back in the moments before a tidal wave descends. Andres stares out into the slaughterhouse hamlet and sees a particularly large and fat knoll longing in an improvised throne made out of what might have once been an altar. 
stripping the flesh from a leg bone with one hand and tossing the remains to a pair of hyenas. A three-headed flail rests within easy reach. Peregrine nods and moves around the lip of the veil towards where the distance between him and the flying will be least. Kazdor and the rest of the party follows. Yort looks at them all like they're crazy. Are you fucking insane? You're just going to walk in there and try to take on a whole horde by yourselves? He makes wrongs right. Ye avenges those who can ye avenge themselves. Ye strikes away grudges and lets the dead pass on in peace, for their business is finished and the ancestors can get back to their work. Kazdor says. And Peregrine stops. When Abari returned from the abyss, he saw his village in ruins, all those he loved destroyed as punishment for his defiance of the Dragon Queen. He fought with hatred, and as he slew dragon upon dragon the wicked fangs of Orcus twisted him. His flesh began to rot, his heart ceased to beat, and his soul began to wither, until he caught his reflection in a deep stream, and saw that he had become the very death he so despised, he says, his voice calm, but like adamantine. I want nothing more than to kill them, to hunt them down to the last and wipe them all from creation, but that won't bring any of their victims back. It won't UN burn this village or any other, so it can't be about that. This is about making sure this is the last one. No more villages will fall to this horde. We kill their leader, they will break. Why we do it doesn't matter. Julian says, this band is a threat to every creature in these lands they come across. Such chaos must be broken. Agreed. These monsters are an abomination, a stain upon the lands that we shall wipe clean. Andres echoes, the abyss's spawn will always seek chaos and destruction. How could I face myself if I allowed it to gain even the slightest edge? Senkit states, her golden eyes ablaze with fury born perhaps of nobility, and perhaps of a more ancient and diabolical drudge. Yort shakes his head in dumbfounded amazement. You are all idiots. Ignoring the infidel, the paladins assemble in a wedge, with Peregrine at the head. A grey sword rouses itself from its sheath, a shield is braced and a morning's tie hungers, a bow is strung, an arrow coils to strike. Two mighty axes sing songs of glories from ten thousand years, and two terrible blades with hilts of bone fly to bloody stained palms, for vengeance, for the forest, for order, for civilization, and for all those who are not yet lost. The paladins roar as one as they charge down the hill into the gluttonous band, death in their eyes and valor in their hearts. The nearest pair of gnolls are caught totally by surprise as the valiant quintet bursts from the trees, before they can react. The Red Avenger is upon them, Silver Axe's hewing head from neck and arm from shoulder. With an oath, Senkit's morning star becomes like the light of the harshest southern sun, clashing through ramshackle shield and ribs beyond. The moonbow sings and the angel's blade falls upon another nearby knoll, striking first axe from hand and then upper body from lower. But Peregrine charges onwards, passing by a confused knoll, making a beeline for the flyend who sees the oncoming paladin and barks a mocking laugh as he takes up his flail and calls his hyenas to his side. The gnolls and hyenas realize that battle is upon them, and barks and snarls sound down the village, drawing the remainder of the group, a score of gnolls and half as many hyenas, down towards the driving spear of the paladins, baying for blood and slaughter. Kazdor and Senkit rush forwards, blocking a path from which the pack of hyenas come baying. In a spray of blood and brain matter, two laugh their last, Andres continues her charge, spying a group of five baying down an avenue. She calls forth in ancient words, Elbertha for Gorm, Revy young Goliath, the land answers her champion's call, and silver vines like spiders thread erupt from the earth, binding and rooting the unfortunate gnolls. Julian flares his wings and falls upon another group, the terrible holiness of his blood on full display, an aura of divine terror radiates from him and the abyssal spawn quail before it. The hyenas lunge for the halfling, but Peregrine cares not, he flows like wine past one, and catches the other on his sword, before striking its head from its body. The flying charges, a prayer to his dark father on his bloody stained lips, bringing the demonic flail down, Peregrine kicks up the body of the slain hyena and the evil weapon destroys it in a spray of gore, but through it the hazel eyes of the Knight of Avery pierce through to his hated foe. Senkit strikes with her shield, channeling divine power so that a flare of burning light accompanies it as she hurls the black corpse of a scavenger away, her mace comes after, breaking the neck of its packmate. Kazdor looses forth the full fury of his draconic blood, 
burning the pack down to their bounds, axe seeking and finding another life to take. Andres draws back her bow and looses into the gnolls slowly scrambling over their comrades, nailing one in the heart. As the gnolls flee before him, Julian pursues, great blade whirling to rip their backs apart as the pathetic creatures retreat. Lunging through the mist of blood and gore, Peregrine lashes out at the great gnoll, his blade turned aside by unnaturally tough hide. Almost casually, he lashes out with his other blade, driving it into its chest, and then channeling his own smite. The wind blows cold as black energy twinkles darkly down the bone-hilted blade, rotting away the hyena's flesh and putrefying its heart. The cowardly hyenas break before the flame and stubborn steel, howling away down the avenue. Andre's group successfully make it past the snarling ball of entrapped gnolls and charge. The agile elf retreats, bleeding badly from several wounds. While Julian drives his batch back, reinforcements arrive, hurling javelins which mostly fall short save one which punches a hole through his wing. Golden Eacher falls to the thirsty earth. The flying drains a storm of blows upon the halfling, striking him across the body and hurling the small warrior back. Wicked energies course through his body, but his resolve holds and he stands his ground. Seeing the need of their friends, Castor and Senkit rush to their aid. In a flash of mist, the Dragonborn arrives by Andre's side, Silver Axes cleaving away an attacker. Senkit rushes to the aid of Peregrine, hurling a bolt of hellfire at the flyant, the purple blaze striking him in the chest. The servant of the abyss looks up at her with hatred and recognition. Andres takes the breathing room, dropping her bow. With a single motion she draws her saber, the cutting chrism splitting one knoll as she drops to a knee, seizes the dagger from her bolt, and rises, driving it into another sternum. Her purple eyes flare and silver light blossoms from the dagger, erasing the beast's chest as blood stains her pale hair. Julian retreats to the side of a burning house, stabbing his grey sword into the earth and pulling his crossbow from his back. Peregrine does not falter before the flyant, returning the fray to deliver two long cuts to its legs, the flesh rotting away in the aftermath of his fell smites. The flyant retreats slightly, then kicks ashes into Peregrine's face before crushing him to the ground beneath the cruel spheres of his flail. He raises it again to finish off the petulant halfling, but it is caught in the remnant of Yolanda's altar. Undeterred by their losses, the gnolls press their attack. Kazdor limps back as a crude axe rips through his leg. Meanwhile, the remaining squad assaults Julian's position. Most are driven back by his aura, but one particularly bold knoll pushes through, stabbing at him with a spear, which Julian catches in the sturdy wood of his crossbow. Kazdor retaliates against the knoll with his offhand weapon, catching it in the ribs with a smite to bring it down, then turning and placing a hand on Andre's shoulder. Maradin, Arken she's an elf but she's near bitch. He offers as a prayer, and is rewarded by a surge of healing magic that closes over most of Andre's wounds. Senkit charges forwards at the flyant, smashing it back into the altar. She raises her mace to crush him, but the monster catches the falling star in its hand. Blood spurts and bones crack but the blow is far from telling. Peregrine. Get up while I've still got him down. Julian forces the spear down and calmly fires the crossbow point blank through the bold gnoll's face. Andres gives a nod of thanks before advancing on the restrained gnolls. There is no mercy from the servant of Sladen. Peregrine struggles to his feet, blood flowing in a river from his chest, but the crossed blades of Avery still stand on his tunic, and he lunges at the beast who slew his people and defiled the altar of his goddess. His first blade strikes true, but the cracking curse of the demonic flail spasms his arm. For a moment his arm flies wide, then he reverses his grip and drives the short sword like a dagger through the flying's heart. Dark power surges and black vines erupt from the ground around the trio as as Peregrine channels every last ounce of power he has left to obliterate an old champion. For a horrible moment, the flying lifts its mace, before its chest and abdomen turn to dust, followed by the rest of its body, until the demon weapon falls useless to the earth. Peregrine collapses from the effort caught by Senkit as he slips towards unconsciousness, only to be caught back up by healing magic. The death of the flying seems to send a shockwave through the remaining gnolls, and they slink away. Julian sighs in relief, Eort finally comes down from where he was hiding. Okay, I was half wrong. You aren't idiots, but you are crazy. You might just have a chance against the boss. This brings glares from everyone but Peregrine, 
who laughs weakly. Yep, we are heroes, you've got to be crazy to be heroes. The party gathers the dead halfings and commits them to the river before setting up camp to rest in the ruins of the hamlet, vowing to return to seeking the abbey when they have recovered from the rather savage beating several of their number have taken. Be me, Pallad, be not me, Peregrine the halfling, Kasdor the scaly dwarf, Julian the Asima, Andres the elf and not a bitch, and Senkit the Chaltan Tifling. Oh, and the Oort, party is recovering after an epic clash against a Nolwarband in the ruins of a halfling village. Too weary to travel any more, they decide to stay the night after committing the remains of the halflings to the river and burning the Nol corpses. Not even Kasdor wants to loot those. As the party begins to bed down, Peregrine seems unusually focused on his food perpetration, and asks Castor to drag over the remnants of the feasting table. Alright laddie but why are ye so big on the food? It was a good day o' slaying but ne great battle, just taking care o' some animals. It's not about that. It's for a going away party. What? You're ne going to leave us after today are ye? Castor says shocked. No, I'm not going anywhere. It's part of my people's tradition that when one of us dies, the rest of their kin hold a feast to say goodbye. I don't think I can make jerky and hard tack that much of a feast, but I owe it to them to try. As amusing as that might be to watch my dear, I think I can handle the food tonight. The party turns as a new voice speaks from behind them to see a halfling woman with golden hair leaning on a quarterstaff, standing before a burrow that most certainly wasn't there a moment ago. It's only right that heroes see a reward. The party is intensely suspicious, but every insight check seems to say that she hears no ill intent. She seems downright matronly, and she looks kindly at Peregrine. Come now. I know things are not always as they seem, but you know me Peregrine. Peregrine's eyes widen and a small grin spreads across his face. The altar catching that strike wasn't just luck was it? Very few things are ever just luck my dear. The halfling woman replies twinkles in her eye and a knowing smile on her face. Thank you for the help with that creature as well Miss Zarathustra. Senkit becomes very still and the party realizes they never actually got her last name. Come come, the food is getting cold and the night is getting dark. This not wise to linger in grim places such as this in the dark. She invites as she goes and opens the door to the burrow. Golden light billows into the late twilight, and the black vines cannot retreat quickly enough, burning away before it. After some hesitation, the party enters, and are greeted with a heavenly aroma and warmth. Their weariness and wounds seem to slip away as a divine serenity washes over them. Before them lies a long table with six for each one, a feast for all upon it. Silver carp and braised trout on a bed of greens, roasted pork tenderloin in mushroom sauce. Steaming bowls of thick soup, freshly baked loaves of golden bread, mugs of dark ale foaming, silver wines in tall glasses strawberry cordials and candied chestnuts, and in the center a platter of strange dark meat which only Senkit seems to recognize. The paladins take their seats, but Yort stands hesitant, before Peregrine invites him to sit opposite him in the last remaining chair. Their host raises her glass solemnly. For those of you who have passed away, we raise these drinks in your memory, we break this bread in celebration of your rest in the golden fields, and we delight in this feast. As you surely delight at the feasting halls of the gods, the party digs in, Senkit piling her plate high with the strange dark meat. Julian takes pause and asks, what is that? Stegosaurus. Senkit practically moans as she attacks the meal with the ferocity of a nesting dragoness. Kazdor drinks from his mug and his eyes go wide. Maradin's beard. This is Bugman. He says as he pours everyone else some. Ye must try this. Clang did smite me if I'll let this masterpiece go unappreciated. Andres takes hers and passes him a glass of the pale wine in return. Fine, but you try that and see how you make proper alcohol. She drinks and her eyes practically bulge out of her head. Ye gods, no wonder you dwarves are so doughty, it's like you managed to brew the mountains into a drink. I lassie, let's see what ye pansy elves think through alcohol I he stood as he drinks it. By the stones. It's light as air but burns in your belly and veins better than whiskey. Did ye brew this with grapes sir starlight? Laughter and feasting proceed for the next two hours until they lie satisfied, full, and in the case of Kasdor and Dundries, exceedingly drunk. Those two lie back in their chairs, 
singing songs that seemed to flow from Dwarvish to Elvish to Common to Draconic to something else entirely with no real rhyme or reason. Senkit lies in her chair in what is best described as a food coma dreaming of dinosaur barbecue. Julian polishes off another loaf of bread, smiling for once and very happy to have his helmet off. Eort is busy devouring the candied chestnuts and attempting to store as many as possible on his person, looking at his staff and wondering if he could hollow it out to hold more nuts. Peregrine sips his cordial thoughtfully. Thank you for all this, and for everything else yo. The halfling woman shushes him before he can finish that name. Give credit where it's due, I'm just a helper same as you. Just one who's been around the bend. Ah. Well then, thank her for me when you see her next. Peregrine says sheepishly. The halfling woman smiles at him and looks around at the rest. Heroes never come in anything but motley crews. Fate is a funny mistress, even if she's cruel too often. She remarks and looks at him. You'll have all at once easier than the rest, and harder than them all put together. But it had to be this way I suppose. Peregrine opens his mouth to ask a question, and then shuts it. If you could tell me you probably would have already. That's the problem with foresight. You can't bloody tell anyone anything clearly without making a mess of it all. But you've got to tell them the riddles and the hints so that they'll go where they need to. Such a headache, especially when you have to tell it in a way that they'll try to stop it and bring it about in the process. Nasty business, makes me glad I'm dead and don't have to bother with it except once every few centuries. So you're a ghost, in a manner of speaking. Things are thin here, so I'm a bit more than a ghost and a bit less than living for the night. Speaking of which you should get some sleep, you've a long road ahead, though help should be arriving shortly. Peregrine shrugs and just accepts it, closing his eyes and drifting off to sleep. He is awoken by a rough tongue licking his face, and opens his eyes to see a particularly large golden retriever with the saddle on its back looking down at him expectant. It barks happily as his tail wags furiously, the sound rousing the others. They are outside on the green, with no sign of the strange woman or her burrow. They are full well rested, and best of all, not hung over. As they take stock of their surroundings, they find each one of them has been gifted with a small bag. For those of you interested, these are lesser bags of holding, a home brew item that works just like a bag of holding, but with one fourth th the capacity. To their delight they each find something already in there. Kazdor finds five bottles of Bugman's special healing potion. Andres finds a set of arrows entirely made of silver, plus one ammunition, 20 arrows. Senkit finds more coffee and a set of three scrolls. Julian finds more bread and a tome containing a spell unlimited bread works. And Peregrine finds a diamond with a scroll. A note attached reads for when the day is darkest. Kazdor looks up from his gift and suddenly sees a scaled creature, built like a horse but standing on its hind legs, with webbed hands and feet eating the leaves off a tree. What in the nine hells is that? Mine. Senkit says with a grin as she walks over and pats her Iganodon on the flank. It turns to nuzzle her affectionately. Sen, we need to have a talk if you're going to be summoning devils. Andre says politely when she is interrupted by the sound of hooves. A magnificent elk canters up to her, while a beautiful black charger trots over to Julian. I take it this is our help. Peregrine says as he mounts up. Where's Kaz's though? There is a snuffling, snorting sound coming from the brush. What is that? Andres asks concernedly. War pig. Kazdor says nonchalantly. War pig? Wouldn't that be a bit short for you? Kazdor barks a command in Dwarven and a titanic boy hog the size of a horse crumbles out of the brush and plops down for him to get on. War pig. Sized for me. Eort. You're with Julian. The hobgoblin nods and mounts up. Well then. I think we're far overdue at a certain captain's court, Julian says as he turns his charger back towards the main road, onwards, to Bloodystone Abbey. So I've recently moved Ikbadia merch over to Teesprings and have a few new designs. Listings are below the video and in the description. Just stop! Just stop it! Stop! No! Just stop it! It's time to stop! It's time to stop, okay? No more! Where the fuck are your parents? Who are your parents? I'm gonna call Child Protective Services! It's time to stop!